Hello and welcome to the channel. Um, we are going to be talking today about this guy here, which is a Gen 3 Plus night vision monocular from GSCI, which I've had for a little while. And um, we're also going to be sort of comparing it to my slightly older um, FLIR uh, Gen 2 HD night vision monocular. Um, and basically what makes them different in terms of quality and um, what you should look out for when buying. Um, before we sort of kick off, uh, please, if you like the uh, the video today, please hit the like button, give it a good thumbs up. And if you want to see more of our content, hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell notification icon so you get notified when we post new content. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the GSCI PBS 14 night vision monocular. This is a Gen 3 Plus uh, monocular that I, I purchased sort of towards the end of last year. I've used it a few times, um, got some thoughts on it, and we're also going to compare it to the sort of my older FLIR device. This is a modernization of the PVS-14 night vision monocular, which is essentially synonymous with the US military. Um, GSCI, who make this guy, this guy is a, they're a Canadian manufacturer, who interestingly enough, when I was researching um, this to actually purchase, they used to make the PVS-14 for the US military. GSCI also produce a PVS-14 for sale commercially as well. Now, the interesting thing about this guy is it's a modernization of that PBS, uh, PVS-14 design with a few sort of things changed to kind of work with the more modern sort of uh, way of doing things, things like the, the way it handles power and so on. So this guy takes a range of 18 millimeter intensifier tubes. Um, you can get a Gen, uh, Gen 2 Plus tube as an option, a Gen 3 commercial tube, a Gen 3 Plus tube, a Photonis XR5 tube, and a Photonis 4G tube as an installable option. You also have a number of options when it comes to auto gating. You can get non auto gated and auto gated versions, and also versions with uh, automatic gain control and ones with manual gain control. This guy has auto gating and automatic gain control and has a Gen 3 Plus tube. Now it has a rugged, um, um, a rugged enclosure which basically allows it to be water resistant and su survive the odd knock and fall. Um, I have dropped it a couple of times, it's still going. Um, it's got wet a few times, it's still going. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things. It's you know, designed to sort of work as a military device and basically survive in most environments. Um, it has a 40 hour battery life. It'll take a CR123 battery just in here. It will also take a AA battery. It does have an extender to be able to take that, but it does take it. And it will it has a 40 hour battery life on that CR123. It also has a polarity independent power supply. And this is quite an interesting feature because it enables you to just stick a battery in any which way um, and it will basically work. Um, unlike the kind of flow device, the flow device requires you to pop in the battery in the correct manner with the positive at this end. So effectively, if you're in, in darkness and you, your battery is going, you want to change it, you're going to whip the top off, drop the battery out, get your new battery and figure out which way it has to go in and make sure it, and so if it's in the wrong way it will not work and you're doing that under the darkness so it can be a bit of a pain in the, in the uh, proverbial uh, with this one you can basically just pop that battery in any which way and it will work and you're back up and running in seconds i've done this a couple of times and i've been using this um, in darkness and literally battery's gone drop drop the, uh, a new battery in from my and with gloves just pop it off it's really really easy and super simple um, and you no know faffing about which is really really nice comes with a couple of mounting options uh, the first of which is the JR mount which goes just here and then it also has a slide mount which basically goes there the floor basically uses the same slide mount design um, they don't really do the J arm on these on the on these floor devices um, the, this basically means I can use this with my existing FLIR mounts. So I've got this uh, FLIR uh, single mount arm and I've also got the FLIR uh, dual mount arm. So I can basically mount both this and this onto this dual mount and make a set of binoculars effectively. Um, as though one eye will have worse vision than the other. 
uh, and then this guy um, basically just run it with the single mount. Now I'm going to just use this to demonstrate uh, the next feature that this has which is quite cool but the feature only really works with the J-Arm uh, mounting option so you're mounting to this. So this mounting option it doesn't work with but just to demonstrate effectively what you have is when the device is mounted and stowed like so um, it will basically be turned off. When you pop the device down into the sort of um, this position and you're using it, um, it will essentially turn on. That's actually quite handy when using when using the device because then you don't have to remember to turn it on and off. And sometimes fiddling around for this switch here, um, I mean on this guy here it's really annoying because it's a, pr a push button um, and you've kind of got to press it and turn this one and all kinds of stuff. It's a bit of pain and fiddle. Um, but with this guy um, it is actually a much easier knob to use but uh, when you're using this sort of on off um, via the actual stow options it makes it so much easier uh, to use. So you've got a range of um, kind of accessories that go with both of these devices. Both uh, Fleur and GSCI do uh, essentially accessories that can work with the, the night vision equipment. Uh, there is essentially a rifle scope adapter, a camera adapter available for these. So you can essentially mount this to a rifle scope and essentially take any normal rifle scope and make it a night vision rifle scope. And you can also uh, mount a camera to this so you can essentially uh, take photographs in the dark and so on. Um, I have used this um, for milsim and airsoft use, but I've also used it in my day job. Um, for taking pictures in darkness and also sort of doing investigations in darkness. And um, it's great, brilliant piece of kit for that. So we're going to talk a little bit now about what makes night vision uh, generations different really. Um, and we're not going to really talk about the technical aspects of the different generations and what the technologies are used. We're going to talk about something that's fairly generic but is sort of used across the board. Um, and it's used to sort of kind of identify how good something's going to be. It's a, almost like a quality indicator of the night vision equipment. And that is basically something called the figure of merit. So figure of merit is a um, essentially a value given to in an image intensifier tube, which tells you pretty much how good it's going to be at intensifying the light that it can essentially capture um, under darkness. That figure of merit value is also used in the US to control the export of night vision equipment from the US. Um, the Department of State in the United States um, set a value of FOM which is kind of the, the, the bar at which a device that has a higher FOM than that bar cannot be um, exported from the US. Any device that has a lower than that bar uh, value can be exported and this is pretty important with the FLIR devices that you see outside of the United States because the interesting thing about these FLIR devices, the, this one here, uh, this is the MNVD51 it has a, a, a couple of sister devices as well. Uh, when you buy this in the US you can actually get a Gen 3 device. Um, you can also get some um, Gen 2 devices which could be very very good and better than anything you'll get outside of the US and come quite close to some commercial Gen 3 devices. So the figure of merit value, what is it made up of? So it takes two parameters to actually create this. They're both multiplied together and essentially they are two parameters relating to the intensifier tube. The first parameter is the resolution. This is in lines per millimeter and it's essentially a number which basically just says, you know, this is how many lines per millimeter the tube has at the center point. The also other value that, uh, that a tube has that's included in this is the single to noise ratio. Now I'm going to sort of talk about some tube types and basically the kind of values that they have and essentially kind of give you an idea of the FOM value, the figure of mate value that they have. And um, we'll start with the FLIR device. So the FLIR device, this is the Gen 2 HD FLIR device. Um, it's an export device, so uh, this is quite important when we talk about uh, the values we're going to discuss because strangely enough, um, the devices that FLIR make, some of them cannot be exported from the US and they will probably be predominantly sold in the US marketplace. 
Um, so you are probably likely to get a better device if you buy the Chen 2 device in the US than you do in the UK or in Europe or whatever. So when I was researching this guy to actually purchase in the first place, um, I basically identified some data uh, uh, specification information that basically Fleur published on the tubes they use. So the resolution values that they use on the tubes that go into this um, Gen 2 HD uh, device, uh, the lowest resolution they, sh they ship is 55 lines per millimeter. The highest resolution they ship is 72 lines per millimeter. So those are the kind of range of, of potential tube options that they have. When it comes to signal to noise ratio, um, with the, uh, the FLIR devices, they start at 15 as the value um, on these tubes and go up to 23. So we extrapolate that out and then basically just sort of work out the potential range of figure of merit values. You can basically start with the FLIR device um, at the low end, with the low end signal to noise ratio and the low end resolution of 55 uh, multiplied by 15, you get a figure of merit value of 825. That's at the bottom end. Then if you take the top end resolution and the bottom end signal to noise ratio and look at those, you get a figure of merit value of 1080 or 1080. If you then take the bottom end resolution of 55 and then combine that with the top end possible signal to noise ratio of 23, you get a figure of merit value of 1265 or 1265. Um, so all of the figures so far are under the bar that's been set by uh, the Department of State in the US. Because the bar, Department of State in the US, they set the bar at a figure of moat value of 1400. And why this is important is this last bit. If you then look at these FLIR devices, at the best possible tubes that they could potentially supply you, with a resolution of 72 lines per millimeter and a single to noise ratio of 23, you get a figure of moat value of 1655. Now that's important because that tube cannot be exported from the US to the rest of the world. So effectively, when Fleur are making these devices, any device has a tube that's that kind of top end will essentially be sold only in the US marketplace and not outside of the US. So effectively, this device um, is essentially limited by that export control value uh, figure of merit of 1400. So one of the things that it became very apparent when I got this is the difference in the quality of the image. And we'll have some images later on to actually sort of highlight this. Um, but effectively, um, the f you can tell there's more sort of noise on, these Im on, on the image essentially um, as a result of the lower quality of the tube that you have with this guy. So this guy has a range of tubes, as I mentioned, and basically um, I went for a Gen 3 Plus tube. Now, basically Gen 3 commercial tubes pretty much start at the 1600 FOM, and they range up to 1799. So that's kind of the, the range that you have with the commercial um, Gen 3 tubes. I went for a Gen 3 Plus tube, which starts at 1800. Now, interestingly, the tube that I got here actually turned out to be over 1800 by quite a lot it was close it was over 2000 so that was a really good thing for me I got a nice a very nice tube here um, if you look at some of the other brands of, of night vision equipment out there so Cobra is a, a quite a predominant brand outside of the US um, they're Russian um, night vision tubes they're gen 3 uh, gen 2 tubes they, they don't publish all the information, but what I've been able to find is some of their Gen 2 Plus tubes, as, as they call them, they start at a resolution of 20, uh, 32 lines per millimeter, and then the kind of top end Gen, um, Gen 2 Plus Pro tubes, as they call them, these are Russian tubes, by the way, um, uh, basically start at 57 lines per millimeter. And if you start looking at some of the other manufacturers like Photonis, who um, essentially are a Dutch uh, manufacturer of night vision tubes. Um, their XR5 tube, which you can get in here, 
Um, you can start uh, with their, the starting resolution is 64 lines per millimeter and a single to noise ratio of 25. Their typical rating, um, so the, the typical tube that they, get, they, they ship has a lines per millimeter of 68 and a single to noise ratio of 26. Now, if you look at the, uh, the figure of merit value for both of those, for the low end, for the starting point, the figure of merit value is 1600 and their um, sort of typical is 1770, which basically kind of puts it right in that sort of commercial Gen 3 tube uh, ballpark. If you look at the Photonis 4G tube, now this is their top end tube and it has a top end price tag. Um, I've not been able to find a price tag for this, but given that the XR5, you can buy them on eBay for about 2,500 um, pounds, essentially used, um, but then you can buy them new starting at about 4,000 pounds up to 6,000 um, pounds. The Photonis 4, G tube will be a considerably more expensive item and they start at a lines per millimeter of 64 but their single to noise ratio is 28 so that basically gives it a, a starting figure of merit of 1800 now the interesting thing their typical shipped tube uh, start has a 72 lines per millimeter um, resolution and a 30 signal to noise ratio which basically means that they have a, a figure of merit value of 2200 so those 4g photonage tubes are seriously decent tubes um, and when i've been kind of looking around at them they are you know, when you buy them as a civilian um, you kind of have to justify why you want them if you're law enforcement you're going to get them but when you when you have to when you want to buy them as a civilian there's paperwork you have to do. So, as I mentioned, commercial Gen 3 tubes, they start quite low at 1600, but then as you kind of go up, they go up to over 2000. And I say, this guy's over 2000. So, what I'm going to put up on the screen uh, is basically a couple of pictures. So, the first one, which I'm showing now, this is the, a picture of a pistol taken against a OR1 background with the FLIR night vision device. Now, as you can see, there's a little bit of noise on the picture. And what I'm now going to do is bring up a picture of the same pistol taken with the uh, PBS-14. As you can see, there is a, dis a, a distinct difference in the quality of the image between the two. One of them is a little bit fuzzier and the other one is a little bit crisp around the edges. You can definitely make uh, things out. Uh, when it comes to sort of uh, looking at it outside, um, I'm gonna put up a little short bit of video which is showing that um, basically taken from my uh, PBS 14, just looking outside of my apartment um, at sort of the, the countryside around my, um, where I live. So there is a very big difference between these two devices. And one of the reasons why I bought this um, Gen 3 device in the first place is I encountered a couple of issues whilst running this FLIR device at an event. The FLIR device is actually really nice. I've had it for over a year now. Um, and to be honest, I've not had many complaints about it. It works really well. It's reasonably priced. This guy, um, the price of this was about £2,700. So it's a good starting point for most people who want to um, use night vision in Airsoft. Um, I, I wouldn't um, basically say it's the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle um, by no, no means. But if you have a budget, I wouldn't spend money on a Gen 1 device. It's essentially wasted money, to be honest. Um, I would save up a little bit more and get this. Um, yes, it's £2,700 is a lot of money, but it is a piece of kit you will have for a long while if you're planning to play Milsim 
uh, for a number of years, you will get great use out of this. Um, it will work in a majority of situations. There are some limitations, and we'll sort of come to that in a second. Just in uh, on, a, uh, on, on the flip side, this guy cost a, a good bit more. Um, this was basically close to £7,000. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, and for most people in Airsoft, this is the better option cost-wise. Um, if you've got the money and you can justify it, then yes, you can buy one of these. You can spend the, the large amount of money. Or you can, if you can get it second-hand, then definitely. Um, if you can get it for a, more, a lower value, then, then that is a, a good option. Um, you know, the thing is that I use this in my business, in my, in my sort of day job, as well as for Airsoft. So I'm able to justify the purchase. Um, and I have used this. And essentially, it has paid for itself effectively by now. So the issue I came across with this guy is we were at an event earlier in the year. And we were playing at a particular site. It was a 24-hour mill sim. Um, in a, a woodland environment and the particular bit of woodland was very dense and when we got out into the cover of the woodland and trying to navigate and move around um, where there was essentially no um, sort, of, sort of breaks in the canopy um, this beca it became impossible to use um, effectively um, I could not see through this more than a few uh, inches to a feet, feet in front of my face it could not pick up enough light because there was not enough light at ground level because it's all blocked by the canopy. When we got out of the canopy into sort of maybe you know a 50-50 canopy, it was still tr struggling because there was just you know just not enough light coming through, um, and because there was low moonlight as well on that particular night, it was a very a very dark night and there was very um, you know, I don't think it was a, 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 a no moon night. I think it was a kind of a quarter moon or something like that. There was a lower light than sort of usual. This struggled. So we had to resort to uh, the infrared um, um, illuminator. Uh, and that helped, but, you know, it's, it's not great if you're trying to move around stealthily. Um, you know, if I was doing this in the day job and it was in low light, it's fine. You know, you're not worried about people seeing you. However, in a Milson, you might want to basically be covert, so infilling into a location. You don't want to be seen. Other night vision users will see your illuminator coming, um, and then that basically just gives your position away. So this struggled. So I kind of um, happened to basically link up with a group of people at that event um, who were running Gen 3 equipment, and they basically were able to operate and, and navigate in that essentially intense darkness with their equipment without the need of an illuminator. So this device um, is actually used by a couple of my teammates or they have essentially the similar or devices or one does have the binocular version. Um, and you know they're pretty happy with it. We're all you know we're all pretty happy with it but we all suffer from the same problem at that same event. Um, and then when we sort of linked up with the with the the two people that were basically running the Gen three equipment, they were able to essentially see. So I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, I, it'd be useful if um, I I picked up a a better device. So I went out and sort of looked at this so Gen three device and and chose this one. Now, strangely enough, um, two months later, I went to the same site. Um, same dense canopy, and I'd had this with me. So I essentially, uh, this had arrived, went out with this, and in the places that we couldn't see with this guy, this guy could. Um, the, the image quality wasn't the best, because when you, even at very low light, you, uh, you know, this is int intensifying a very small amount of light and trying to make it visible. So, um, when there is essentially very little light there, it tries its hardest, and this guy just isn't able to do it, whereas this guy can. And effectively, what this was it was possible with this is to actually intensify the light enough for me to be able to at least navigate. Um, and that was that was pretty useful. When we got out into the sort of open areas where the light was much 
uh, essentially much more um, prevalent, it being not darkness and all. Um, again, image was crisp and clear and you could see just a, that little bit further than you could with the Gen 2 device because there is essentially a range element to all night vision equipment. So your Gen 1 devices, they generally can't see very far. Um, uh, the Gen 2 devices can see a little bit further than that um, with, 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 that gives you enough clarity to actually see something and then the Gen 3 devices um, do even better. Now that's basically why I went for this guy and it is the, you know, I don't expect most people will suffer that same situation that often um, or basically when it does happen you can work around it. You know, we worked around it because we linked up with a group of people who had Gen 3 equipment and that's kind of one of the reasons why I got this is that in, in the group that I, that I uh, do Milsons with, um, essentially I'm the Gen 3 guy. So I can basically, you know, when we're in those sort of situations where it's very difficult to see, I can take point, lead, do the navigation while the guys behind me are still running on these Gen 2 devices. They can see to a certain extent, um, but effectively I can then do that main navigation to the point at which we need to do anything and then we can sort of uh, work from there. So um, I, it's, it's one of those, those things, it's pretty useful to have at least someone operating on Gen 3 um, and then if everyone else is operating on um, Gen 2, they're still, they're not handicapped that much. So if I was recommending someone to buy something, then I would definitely recommend buying uh, a Gen 2 sort of plus HD um, or Gen 2 HD device like this guy. Um, if you're sort of operating on a re on a sort of reasonable budget, um, I wouldn't really recommend someone buying a Gen One device. Um, it's essentially you're going to be wanting to replace it after a while. Um, you will have to use um, uh, IR illuminators a lot of the time, and in most most instances, especially in mill sims, if you're trying to be stealthy, that's just not going to work. Um, save up a little bit more money, go for the Gen Two device. Fleur makes some great devices. They're um, the, the one thing I don't quite know about the FLIR devices is their tube size. Um, I have a suspicion they're a 14 mil tube because this is, um, when I kind of look at these side by side, the, the sort of the tube housing and everything else is slightly smaller on the FLIR device than it is on the, uh, the PBS 14. Um, but it is a, a, a decent device, has a good warranty. Um, you know, it's, ITAR free, you can you can move it around Europe, you can take it anywhere to Milsims. You know, if I'm we're gonna do a Milsim in Europe, I might have trouble shipping this somewhere, um, but I won't have any trouble shipping this. Um, unless you're kind of going um, to countries that are on kind of lists, in which case don't. Um, I've taken to be fair though, I've taken this um, in Europe a couple of places. Both of those are generally okay. Um, I was visiting places that basically there, there wasn't necessarily a problem with. Um, but essentially you have to sometimes be careful when transporting one of these um, Gen 3 devices outside of the United Kingdom or anywhere that basically um, is a little bit uh, less uh, more restrictive. So this is a great device. I would, if you've got the money and can justify the, the purchase cost of a Gen 3 device, uh, this is definitely worth the money. Um, I would say if you can get a good quality device second hand um, at a decent price, um, that's Gen 3, again, definitely worth it. Um, as long as that device is, you know, being well, uh, has essentially has been well loved, uh, not well used, um, because essentially if that tube life is coming to an end, you might have a very big cost to get a new tube. As I kind of mentioned, the, the, like the tube cost for the Photonis XR5 they start at around £4,000 and they go as high as uh, £6,000. Depending on the kind of tube options like auto gating and gain control, they add to the cost. Um, so that can make a big difference. Um, if you wanted like a Photonis 4G tube, you're looking at an even bigger jump. Um, and then, for instance, getting alternative Gen 3 Plus tubes, can, again, it could be quite expensive. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the drawbacks if you're buying second hand is how old is the tube? How, how many hours has it basically had? Um, because those, these tubes do degrade over time. Uh, 
the, the FLIR tubes, you know, FLIR are, are an international organization. Um, they've got a very good support network. You can, you know, buy, buy one of these from a lot of different um, suppliers. Um, this, this guy came from a, a vendor that I could have acted as the, uh, the distributor effectively for, for GSCI. Um, they were great to deal with. Um, I'll put a link to them in the description and essentially this device. Um, but then, you know, the flow devices, you can buy these quite, quite easily from a, a, a quite a large number of potential vendors um, across, across Europe and, and, and internationally. Um, and if you're in the US, there are again, there are a lot of different vendors that you can supply them as well. So if you're on a reasonable budget, get the flow. If you've kind of got the money and can justify it, get a Gen 3, get the PBS 40, and I do like it. It's a really nice piece of kit. Um, it's well made. It's, it's, it's got a great support network behind it in, in GSCI and warranty, um, just like Fleur do. They're not a big company like Fleur. Fleur are international. They have offices all over the world. GSCI are basically based in Canada, um, but they, they do take pride in their kit. So with that, um, if you found today's video useful, um, hit the like button. Um, if you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And with that, thanks for watching. Have a great day and see you guys next time.